Big luxury SUVs represent a pretty small slice of the overall sales pie, but it might surprise you just how competitive the segment really is. Just take a look at the top. Even the most popular models like the Mercedes GLS Class and Cadillac Escalade only move about a few thousand units a year. And then you have something like the Infiniti QX80 that sold 850 in Canada last year. That's pretty impressive on its own, but it's even more impressive when you consider this thing is a decade old now. And the reality is, I think its age might be why this beast is still so popular all these years later. reviews don't forget to share our channel and subscribe so you can catch some of this and maybe even a little of that all right guys before we get started i gotta say it is friggin cold outside that's about as canadian as i will ever get but it is true now it's warmed up quite a bit and it's still right around minus 10 or 12 and the bad news is that means that even though i took this thing through a car wash it's not quite as clean as we normally like. Now, Will in the back, he's mostly disappointed because it doesn't look quite up to his standards on camera. So please forgive him. No, it's not his fault. And it's not really mine either. So anyways, now we've got that out of the way. Let's talk about the QX80. And like I said in the intro, this thing is a decade old. Actually, it might be more than a decade old. I think it came out in 2010. Three updates, a name change later, it's mostly the same. That's not necessarily a bad thing, though. Now, it's also kind of oxymoronic to say this is no frills luxury, but that kind of sums it up best. It's obviously got some good stuff, but it's not brimming with the latest features, mostly because it's old. There is some stuff missing. No massaging seats. I know. First world problems. There's also no head-up display. That's the bigger one for me. But I do have a question for you guys. Is it features that make it a luxury vehicle or is it the feel? Is it the build quality? Is it the vibe? You tell me what you think in the comments. Is it more than just the features that make it a luxury vehicle or is it the features that you're paying for? I want to know how you guys feel because I'm sort of mixed on it, okay? I do think the features make up a large portion of that vibe, but I also feel like when you get in and you get a sense of the vibe of it, this one is a prime example where it doesn't have too much flash, but it feels like a cocoon of luxury. You're in here, it's fairly quiet. There's quite a bit of wind noise off these door mirrors, but other than that, it's pretty quiet. It's pretty comfortable. So I feel like it is luxurious, but by modern standards, when you're expecting a lot of flash and tech, well, you're not gonna find that here. So anyways, let me know what you think in the comments below. Now, the big change for 2022, this 12.3 inch touchscreen up here on the dash, it really does modernize. It gets rid of that two screen setup. It's a lot more user friendly, but it's still not super up to date. If you take a look at the built in navigation, yeah, it's got real MapQuest vibes, but for the most part, it's cool. It does also have wireless Apple CarPlay this year, though. Android Auto, you still got to plug your phone in. I personally prefer to plug it in anyways. Earlier this week, I forgot to charge my phone. I was going to meet some friends and I was down around 20%. I figured, yeah, I'll just throw it in this wireless charger and head out to meet them. But because I had maps going, music, all that good stuff, well, it basically just stayed static. Now my phone is a couple years old now, but my point is if you really wanna charge quickly, you're better to plug it in anyways. But it is cool that it's got that wireless connection because if you're just running in, to the store or something and you get back in, well, you can keep your phone in your pocket and it'll automatically reconnect. And I do dig that a lot. And that again is something only for iPhone users, at least for now, because Android Auto is a hard connection. And then, like I said, there's no head up display. There are no massaging seats, but they are heated and ventilated up here, three stage for both. And then you get heated rear seats. You also get a heated steering wheel, all that good stuff that you'd expect. And then otherwise, what can I say? 
This is a 12 year old Infinity and it looks like it, especially with this beige upholstery. Now you can get black and this really cool brown leather. I like that a lot and I feel like that's gonna be more palatable for more people. This is a little more old school and it really goes with this heavily lacquered wood trim everywhere. And then the other thing I gotta complain about because I always do, all of this gloss black. It's just impossible to keep clean. I really hate it and I wish automakers would stop using it. There is a ton of it here and it just really doesn't look all that nice. But for the most part, everything else about this is what you would expect from an Infinity product. It's very luxurious, it's very stately, right? It just feels like it's something special. Again, not overly fancy in terms of technology, but it just feels like a luxury product. And I think that's what you're paying for. And again, speaking of the old school flair, well, this has the same engine that it had it actually dates back to about 2004, I think, back when this thing was called the Infiniti QX56, which was a nod to the engine displacement. It's a 5.6 liter V8. And now it did get updated for 2010. So it's got direct injection now, as well as a big bump in output. But this engine is basically unchanged. There's no cylinder deactivation, no ignition stop start system, just big, huge V8 power. It makes 400 horsepower and 413 pound feet of torque. Both of those numbers are still class competitive all these years later. And this thing's got a lot of guts when you put your foot into it. And like I said earlier this week when I had it, I went and met up with some friends because a buddy was buying some Dana 60 axles for a Jeep project. I said, yeah, we can throw a trailer on the back of this thing. This can pull 8,500 pounds. It's got a class four hitch. That is standard in both trims and a seven pin connector. It's got everything you need. And I'll tell you right now, this thing can tow with the best of them. This engine is just so smooth and torquey. And when I had that trailer hooked up, there was about 3,000 pounds on the back and about 700 pounds of payload inside. And it was hilariously easy. Again, that is nowhere near what this thing is rated to pull as a maximum. But it just goes to show you how effortless it makes towing because I could honestly barely even notice that the trailer was back there. It was only really when I was braking and stuff like that. And at highway speeds, I'm talking triple digit speeds. Yeah, RPM was like 1600 revs. I couldn't believe just how low the engine speed was with all that weight. Very impressed. Like I said, it's smooth and torquey and there's just so much brute force, but it's also really smooth. It works well with this transmission as well as the four wheel drive system. Now, all versions of the QX80 in Canada have standard four wheel drive. That's not the case in the States and it has benefits, especially this time of year. We've been walloped with snow over and over. It's got four high and low range gearing. So if you do need to have it locked in, you can do that, but it's got this four wheel automatic setting and it works really well. Now you are going to notice it plowing a little bit. This morning when I was heading out here, the roads had barely been plowed. So when I was turning and stuff like that, you could feel it under steering and it would start to push to the outside of the turn before you'd get that extra traction. The system would react. Keep in mind, it's four wheel drive and not all wheel drive. So it reacts a little differently than some of the other vehicles I've reviewed when I'm heaping all that praise about how responsive. Those are a little bit more proactive. This tends to be more reactive, but it works really well. We've been driving through lots of snow and also you can really get all that torque down when you put your foot into it. It sounds pretty good too. We're off to a pretty good start, right? Heaping a lot of praise on this powertrain. So what's the problem? Well, it runs into a brick wall when it comes to fuel consumption and emissions. This is one of the thirstiest SUVs on the market today. Now, the Lexus LX, that used to be even worse than this, but now the only one as far as standard non-performance SUVs that's worse than this on the market is the Jeep Grand Wagoneer, which is hilarious because that is brand new and this thing is sold, but this is good for a combined 15.1 liters per 100 kilometers, which is terrible on its own, but I have been doing way worse than that. And even if you take that towing test out of the equation, today alone, we have been up 
at almost 20 liters per 100 kilometers. I honestly just cannot believe how terrible this thing is on gas. Jody is going to have a hard time approving my expenses at the end of the month because the fuel bill here is going to be huge. But you know, for those complaints, I gotta say this thing is very easy to drive. It's super smooth. And a big reason why, this is the top trim and it has what Infinity calls hydraulic body motion control. There's no air suspension here. And you might be thinking that's a shame. I kind of thought that heading into this week too, but I actually really like it. And a big reason why, it doesn't require power to run the system like an air suspension setup, right? Or even some of those more traditional uh, adaptive suspension systems that are gonna run off of the vehicle's power. This doesn't do that. It's basically like, remember when you were in school, maybe you had a tech teacher or something that would show you if you put two syringes attached a hose and one of them had fluid in it. And as you pushed the plunger in one, it would push the plunger out on the other. That's kind of how this suspension works. So when the front wheel hits a pothole, it just pushes the hydraulic fluid back so that it alleviates that pressure, but it does it in a controlled way. It's slow. And then the same goes with the other side because it's not connected for each axle. It's actually connected each side of the vehicle. And the same goes with body roll. Once you start to turn, well, it just fills up this collector. I don't know exactly what Infinity calls it, but it's basically like a little reservoir. And all that fluid just pools in there and it firms up the system so there's not much body roll. It's actually very nice. And as the name would suggest, there's a lot of body control here. I'm really impressed, especially for the size of this thing because it is huge. Now, there's no extended version like you can get with something like the Cadillac Escalade. But as you can see, this is a big vehicle. You can get it in seven or eight passenger configurations. And that means basically you could have a bench in the second row or captain's chairs. The cost is the same for each trim. That part is cool. This one has the captain's seats. It's really neat the way it's set up. It's got that center console. There's also that rear seat entertainment system in the back. That's neat too. And speaking of, tons of features in here. Again, nothing too flashy, but enough that you would expect. And a lot of it's standard too. Wi-Fi hotspot, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, Bluetooth, heated and ventilated front seats, heated steering wheel, great stereo system, built-in nav. It is up to most of the standards of your average full-size family hauler, but where it falls a little bit short, again, is in the luxury department. And it's not just features that are missing, but even the feel in here. Some of these controls ripped straight from the Nissan parts bin, and some of them are super old, like these memory buttons here for the driver's door. They just look and feel pretty cheap and dated. But again, you kind of know what you're getting going into it, knowing just how old this thing is. And then if you do step up to this top trim, there are a few other features that do elevate the experience just a little bit. None of it's too crazy, but there's an air purification system in here, which is pretty cool. Bigger wheels, auto leveling headlights, and that fantastic suspension system. The only issue I have really is with the advanced safety features. Now you do get blind spot monitoring standard, as well as lane keep assist, lane departure warning, all that stuff. But adaptive cruise control, that's not standard. You can only get it in this top trim. And the even weirder part is if you look at the mechanically identical Nissan Armada, that comes with standard adaptive cruise control as well as all the other advanced safety features. That is pretty weird because it's something like $11,000 less. And then if you look at this one, well, it's up above 90 grand before tax because it's got that freight fee that you're never gonna get out of. That is a non-negotiable. So this is quite expensive and that really is the issue. It is a cool vehicle. I like it a lot and I can see why other people do too. I can understand why people are still buying them because it's just kind of no fuss. You don't have to worry about much. You don't have to figure out how to use expansive screens or crazy, super advanced adaptive cruise control or any of that sort of stuff. It's just kind of turnkey or push button, get in and go. But again, it doesn't quite feel like it's up to the same standards as some of its competitors that cost in the same ballpark. That is the big sticking point for me. But otherwise, it is a pretty cool family hauler. To recap, I like the Infiniti QX80's Herculean strength, its hydraulic suspension setup, and how easy it is to drive.
I don't like how terribly inefficient it is, that it's pretty pricey for its age and lack of standout features, and that adaptive cruise control isn't standard. Okay, so there's a slight problem with the age of the QX80, and it's that there's not much here to help it earn its flagship status in the Infiniti lineup, aside from the fact that it's the biggest one you can buy. If you take a look at the Cadillac Escalade, it's got all kinds of screens inside and semi-autonomous driving tech that help justify its price tag and its status. There's none of that here, but then there's a certain kind of charm that comes with a vehicle so firmly rooted in the past. If you don't mind the astronomical fuel bill that comes with it, not many SUVs deliver this amount of capability with the same kind of moxie as the Infiniti QX80.